Hello and welcome back to Lorsworn Chronicles Crusader Kings. I am TJ, that's Asa TJ on Twitter. We are playing as the pagan kingdom of Kironia and Queen Dyra the Legendary. Um, but are we? I think we need to take a quick, uh, what I'm going to call a social history break. Uh, Crusader Kings 2 is very focused on the, the nobility, the political power holders, um, and the... Well, political history, uh, which is only one facet of history, um, and when I'm actually when I actually study history, uh, as opposed to just playing historical strategy games, I found that especially in recent years, it's it's kind of one of the least interesting facets of history, and that might just be because that's how it was always taught to us. And when you discover other facets of studying history, you're like, oh wow, this is cool and new. So. I do want to take periodic breaks throughout this series to uh, talk about social history a little bit, which is the more the history of the people on the ground. Let's let's go ahead and let's turn the borders off. Um, borders are artificial. This is this is really what we're looking at. We're looking at uh, a a world uh, with lots of varying cultures and geographies and uh, environmental factors that are affecting everyone's day to day lives. Um, and thinking about what, what's actually going on for the people on the ground right here. It's been about a century since we adopted early feudalism and uh, reformed the religion. So we have, uh, you know, parts of the country are still uh, worshipping the same way that they have for hundreds, maybe thousands of years before this. They don't really recognize the new priesthood they're they're kind of just doing their own thing some of them are following gods that uh don't even necessarily show up in our holy books uh or they might be cognates to gods that show up in our holy books uh the slavic people have perun who at this point in time is probably equated fairly heavily with perkunas of the the formal dia of Tureba religion that's a pretty easy connection to draw may even be identified with the Germanic Thor, which uh, Perun, the Slavic Perun, was historically identified with the uh, Germanic Thor by some writers. They're both striker gods that uh, beat up serpents and bring lightning and quite possibly were uh, offshoots of the same early Proto-Indo-European uh, mythology. Uh and then we also have the interesting fact that uh, our, our realm, uh, a lot of it's tribal right now. This this county in particular, I think, is going to be an interesting one to talk about uh, because they're they're Lithuanians. They they don't speak the same language as the rulers right across the border from them. They still follow the old faith, and uh, they're still a tribal society. So. Um, Whereas, you know, right across the border in Vilnius, right across the border in Deltuva, we've got this structure set up where the king is collecting taxes, or the queen actually at this moment in time, collecting taxes from their vassals. Uh, these vassals have to set up a way of, you know, going out into the countryside and actually getting these taxes from the local uh, villages. In the case of uh, Deltuva, there's a fortified... Uh, hill fort uh likely with a, a fairly um uh robust city growing up around it which is utterly different from what we would see um over here in in Nalsia where it's probably still scattered villages um economic activity has probably picked up you know they're on a, they are on the uh fork of a river that is, uh, um, you know, it flows all the way out to, uh, like, Mimel and the Baltic, so, you know, there's commerce coming through here, um, they may or may not have figured out ways to capitalize on this commerce, uh, the local chief might charge some sort of a due for passing through here, um, if, if it's within the, uh, within his ability to do so. So, you know, even even after everything that's happened, the average person living in Nalsia, probably not a ton has changed for them. 
um, versus where 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 we were in Akko's time, even. Uh, they're potentially a little bit safer uh, because they are closer to the uh, capital, which is under the active protection of the crown. Um, now, of course, people out here, uh, they... They are, they are possibly a little worse off, even. Uh, the kingdom is prospering, but that doesn't mean all of its people have benefited a whole lot. If you look at a, a county called Karachev, you know, they're getting... You know, they're getting their shit burned down pretty regularly. They're, they're on this nomad step frontier, and the crown has proven time and time again that either they don't have the money, they don't have the logistics, or they just don't really care enough uh, to protect this area. Uh, if there was a, an uprising, which we've seen a couple of times, where uh, these peasants were like, we're going to break free from this because... Uh, we don't want to be part of a... We don't want to be part of a kingdom that's not even going to protect us from horse nomads coming and taking our shit and, like, kidnapping our family members and carting them off uh, and, you know, killing our, our sons and brothers. Um, if that happened, if they challenged the sovereignty of the king... Then an army is going to come in and do something about it. Then an army is going to come in and fight them. The army is not fighting for them. Um, which kind of gives you an idea of... The precarious idea of a medieval state that we have here. Um, we talked about this a little bit around um, when Akko died and everything kind of erupted into chaos. Uh, there's, there's some of that still going on in the sense that, yeah, we have nominally these are our borders this is we 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 recognize that this is these are the imaginary lines that we've drawn around our kingdom but out here they're not necessarily part of the kingdom in in the sense that these more innermost areas are our administration doesn't really stretch out here um it's mostly still tribal uh it's culturally distinct uh we have russian which is CK2 kind of represents this as, um, it can appear as a melting pot culture. It can also appear if any of the East Slavic cultures are conquered by a foreign power, which kind of causes them to gel into the Russian culture in that, um, in that sort of, uh, uh, situation of top-down pressure. As you can see, since the uh, Novgorod has remained independent. They're still Ilmenian. They have not had any reason to become, to develop this Russian identity yet, because they're perfectly fine. They are, they are Ilmen. They are from around Lake Ilmen. That's what they identify as. They don't feel the need to identify as anything else. But then areas we've conquered that used to be Ilmenian, they're starting to uh, develop this Russian culture uh, that sort of represents that... Uh, uh, Scottish is actually very similar. It appears the the most likely way for it to appear is if Picts get conquered by Gales or Anglo-Saxons, they might start to identify as Scottish. And that's a whole... I could do a whole history video on a lot of these topics, so I don't want to ramble on for too long. Um, yeah, these people are kind of... They're under the heel of the crown without... Uh, necessarily reaping a lot of the benefits of that. Uh, they, they certainly, they're kind of left to protect themselves. Um, I'm sure that they probably are developing more commerce because they can now sail down the Desna and link up to all of these trade routes, uh, which gives them a lot of mercantile opportunities. The fact that within this kind of sphere, trade is unified and you can expect your merchants to be able to get from you know, Kiev to Estonia without being harassed, which definitely was not the case uh, in Akko's time. It was a bunch of different tribes, and someone would, you know, stop you and make you pay a toll, or, uh, you know, they would raid your boats or whatever. So at least there's that, but then also bringing money into these areas makes them more likely to get raided, um, unless you can somehow find a way to leverage that uh, influx of cash into... Um, setting up fortifications, uh, which is probably, hopefully, what will eventually happen. Um, I had another point to make about this before we unpause the game, but I might save that for a later episode, because when I don't write down notes and I just try to go stream of consciousness about social history for, uh, for a few minutes, a lot of times I'll, uh, I'll lose track of what I was thinking. 
Um, oh, yeah, so the other thing is uh, we are in this kind of expansionist imperialist phase, uh, which is bringing a lot of resources into the kingdom, um, bringing a lot of land into the kingdom, which is good for the people who are already here to some extent because they're going to be able to derive wealth from this. The merchants are going to be able to expand their trade networks. Um, there will be spoils of war and slaves brought back from the newly conquered territories, definitely. Um, so, in that sense, uh, that's one way that, that a medieval ruler could sort of keep things in line. It's the primary way that the Roman Empire <laughs> kind of held itself together. They had to keep expanding once they got past a certain point. And I think we might be past that point if you look at the size of our kingdom right now. We're like, yeah, we have to keep expanding to keep bringing more resources in. And this is going to continue all the way into EU4 as a trend. And I'm sure we will be talking about it a lot then because, man, is there a lot to talk about <laughs> regarding the age of exploration, uh, the major European empires, and how that created a breeding ground for colonialism. Um... But yeah, we should probably get back to the game. Um, yeah, at this point, not just protecting our trade, but conquering more outlying areas just so we can continue feeding resources in and keeping economic growth at the level that people in our core areas are used to um, so it doesn't start to stagnate, so we don't start to, you know, flatline economically or decline economically that would start to become really important at a moment like this, and it would spur us to continue our conquests. Um, it would further spur us to continue our conquests as a third motive beyond protecting the, ri the river, river trade, expanding the river trade, and then now the concern we have of we have to beat up all the steppe nomads or they're just going to keep raiding us forever. So, I think our next target is going to be the uh, Khan of the Vakrimids. He's a Khazar uh, breakaway clan, probably, of some fashion. I would imagine his he had an ancestor who maybe was a, a vassal of the Khazar, Khazars. I'm going to try to start pronouncing that correctly, and not the weird anglicized way that I learned from years of hearing people saying it wrong. Um... But yeah, this this area here um, was previously an area that was mass converted by us. We pumped a lot of money in it to make sure that they would stay true to the faith. And they have, at least the, the people here have. So they might see us as liberators, uh, at least until they realize that we don't have the cash or the uh, infrastructure or the even political will <laughs> to... Uh, to um, protect these outlying areas, because now they're just going to be in the path of the larger Khazar Khaganate once we take this land. So, this guy is telling me that uh, Chief Zintis is a traitor. Um, I don't believe that at all. Um, but I'm not going to accuse... Lauskas is either because I, I he's he's a bro he has a hundred opinion of us and he's a very good spy master so I don't want to do anything to mess that up so we're going to move our retinues down here those are the kind of conversations I want to have more often but I also do kind of want to keep the game going so definitely let me know in the comments what you feel like the right balance of that is I know there's not going to be a balance that works well for everybody some people want more talking. Some people will want more gameplay. Um, I, but I, uh, I want to kind of do some of both because uh, I think it is something that definitely sets this channel and, and our let's plays aside from other people who just look at it as more of a board game, which is definitely not how I look at Paradox games at all. So my husband uh, is shitting his brains out. Let's see if we can do anything about that. <laughs> Going straight from. Uh, academic discussion of uh, the uh, plight of empires into uh, explosive diarrhea. That's uh, that's Crusader Kings for you. Looks like they're being invaded by the Khazars at the same time here. And uh, is that the Khazar army right there? 
And are they going to try to conquer it before we get to it? Or for Bryansk? Where is Bryansk? Is it the is it the higher level? Okay, so they just want this down here. That's fine, actually. Um, because that's not what we're going to go after first. We're going to liberate Novasil first. And... Actually, we should probably Holy War, because then... Yeah, then we can... We might... Uh, I'll accept all of these Tengri guys might join in. Alright, let me make sure I understand these. I need to, like... Just get a cheat sheet for what the different CBs actually do. So if we liberate it, vassalizes non-nomadic lords and takes all other titles. This guy is tribal, so we would vassalize him. He is Tengri, Tigri pagan, Alan of our faith. This guy is Alan of our faith. Okay. So this guy's going to be trouble. Um, hopefully we can get him to convert. Oh, he's zealous. He's not going to do it. All right, holy war it is. Holy war for Novasil. And the council approves, of course, 7 to 0. Let's raise our troops. Dyra with that 38 combat skill. She deserves the title Legendary. She will probably be known as one of the best generals of this era. Meaning, like, the entire medieval era. I'm gonna have to remember this, what, which episode this is, so I can give it a different title for the people that really geek out about social history. Um, we're gonna sacrifice a cow. It's been a while since we did that. Pleases the gods. We got some good omens going on. All right. Kagan. The Karadid. I don't know where he is. Is he a vassal of someone? Oh no, he's a breakaway state from Bukal with one county. Yeah, I'm not I'm not that scared. Now can we join this battle? Is my question. Uh I am going to gain the patient trait. Let's screenshot that. No, I didn't actually, didn't actually pick it up. Okay, must have been a percentage chance thing. So we are opportunistically joining this battle on the side of the Khazars, which is it's an interesting. So the Khaz, we're we're kind of d deciding to partition this place area with the Khazars now because they're about to get destroyed. And all of a sudden, this Curonian army shows up uh, out of nowhere and is, is uh, like Stannis at the at the wall in Game of Thrones. If you guys know the episode I'm talking about, where we come charging in uh, from the, uh, I guess this is all plains, but we come charging across the plains. We don't even have horses. We just start cutting dudes down with axes and, and shit. Um, oh, sweet. We got the attacker position, too. And we help them ward these guys off. Uh, so we were like, yeah, you can have the southern part and we'll just, we'll take the part that's, uh, we paid a lot of money to con help convert to our faith and uh, it'll be great. Apparently I fulfilled the ambition to groom an heir. I didn't get a message about what edu the education trade you got was. Prince Akko is a brilliant strategist, appropriately enough. Saba the Bastard, also a brilliant strategist. They could have an interesting little rivalry there. The older illegitimate brother and the younger legitimate one. That's kind of a classic, classic medieval uh, 
succession crisis, isn't it? Okay. So the war for Nova Sil has been invalidated. This guy is now in jail. Do you want to become our vassal? Oh no, he's still he's still Tengri. Okay. That's okay. They took what they wanted. Now we will take what we want. Pick an ambition. We want to see the realm. Actually, we want to build a war chest. We've got some construction that needs to happen, so we're going to we're going to tax the shit out of people. That never goes wrong. Let's see, 28, let's see, 19 and 12, 23 and 9. Oh, that's my husband. I was like, King of Curonia? Is there another <laughs> country called Curonia? Oh, right, he's my husband. Uh, declare war. Can we... Okay, we're going to do Holy War for Nova Sil. Realistically, I would kind of expect in this situation that the uh, Dee of Turi believers in the population would be rising up to help us. Let's see if anyone comes in to help him. Uh, let's let's read a goat. Oh, bad omens. Poland is just not doing well. <laughs> it's kind of unfortunate. Every country that seems like they're going to be the uh, the Christian hope to serve as our rivals. Wow, oh, huge revolt in Kizaria right now. They want to install a new Khan. So that won't necessarily destabilize the realm significantly. Okay, we might be able to win this if we're really smart. So this guy is a direct leader. We're gonna put him in the center. Thyra's gonna be on one flank. She should be on the flank with more people. Yeah, that's good. And then, aggressive, yeah. Roman, where'd he get that name from? Uh, he's Russian, okay. I don't know that Roman would be a prop popular Russian name in this timeline since they're not they don't see themselves as the third Rome, but, uh... Alright, we're being praised, we're being attacked by nomads. Who are these guys? Here is Slavl. Let's see. Bulgars joined. I'm gonna screenshot all of these, so the... The Bulgar Marauder, whose nickname's the Bulgar Marauder. We have the High Chief of Miram and the High Chief of uh, Pereyaslavl. Pere it's a Pereyaslavl. Pere there we go. It's probably at least close. So the High Chief of Kiev, which is not actually located in Kiev, it's actually the High Chiefdom of. Uh, whatever this county is called, Medie, Medie, Mediebi. He wants to convert. I will accept that. He's a Croatian. Okay, so we won the Battle of Novosil fairly decisively there, despite being outnumbered because we're just that good. All right, the conversion of Kiev. More people want to follow our religion. Okay, so we have a fairly large host here. Our reinforcements are gonna get there in time to stop them. Second Battle of Novosil, 
You are in the thick of it during the battle, and your tally of slain enemy soldiers has impressed even the most grizzled sergeants in your army. As you clean the blood splatter off your sword and armor, the men cheer for the bravery you displayed during securing this victory. All right. Fantastic. Let's go take out this army real quick before they have time to start any trouble. Yeah, we are, uh, we're kicking butt here. This is, this is something that, uh, in actual history, that I don't think there's really any precedent for this, where, where we're just tossing aside nomadic army after nomadic army. Apparently, we fulfilled the ambition to, uh, build a war chest. So more people are adopting feudalism. It makes sense. I mean, they can enrich themselves more that way. Using the uh, feudal system. There's also the fact that we are probably highly encouraging people to adopt feudalism because they need some way to pay their royal taxes. Uh, oh, I want to see if I can pass a law real quick. Um... We're still trying to limit the power of the council, so banishment, imprisonment. Pretty much everybody is cool with us right now, so we're gonna we're gonna pass a law that says we're the only ones available allowed to revoke titles. All right, we want to stay out of factions. Laughed at the evidence. All my vassals always laugh at the evidence whenever I try to. Pressure them. Okay, so now... Daira has, in addition to our other accomplishments, moved us closer to an absolute monarchy. Okay. <laughs> so he, he decided to convert, uh, probably because his own peasants were pushing him to, and because we were about to completely run over his realm. Um, unfortunately, that invalidates our war again, but we are still determined to gain control over this area, uh, for economic uh, reasons, among others. So, do you want to be our vassal? No. So, we are going to force vassalization on you now. <laughs> you, you thought you were sparing yourself uh, further devastation, but you're actually just prolonging the war at this point. And now you're, the other Tengri are not going to save you. We're going to look at some burbs. Oh, the burbs. The burbs are not uh, not good to us this day. Conversion of Moravia. Moravia has converted to the Sunni faith. You might end up with a Muslim Europe. You never know. The Amukids are doing pretty well for themselves, but so is Pagan Aquitaine, and Saxony is still definitely the great power. Uh, we're going to sacrifice this guy to Dievas. My chiefdom of Kiev. Probably going to end up destroying it. Yeah. Serp. Destroy. Keep those guys balkanized. I mean, they're going to be pissed at us now, but... He'll get over it. Alright. So, the peasants down here are probably like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> our, our leader converted. Uh, we're, we're happy now. Why are we still being invaded? But, why, uh, why would, um, why would what the peasants think matter? We're far beyond that at this point. Alright. I'm gonna be friends with this guy, Chief Levs of Ulanets. Alright. Can't wait to hear all of the comments, all of the wonderful, pleasant comments uh, disputing my assertions at the beginning of this episode about Russian ethnogenesis. That's... just can't wait. Um, 
We have, the fact is we don't really know what exactly went on with uh, the Russian ethnogenesis. The development of the Russian identity it was probably a combination of things. Um, let's see. Cool. I was just thinking of that since I was seeing that that guy was still Ilmen culture. All right. So this should be pretty easy. Oh, hell. Moodiness, lashing out, I have become stressed. We're gonna switch to a drinking focus until we get rid of that trait, and then we'll go back to hunting. My son, Rushki. Um... He deserves greatness. I don't care if he hates me. He recruits. Alright. Estonian populace in Sarima have embraced Curonian culture. That kind of makes sense. Um, since it is such a trade hub where merchants from all over are... Uh, actually... A lot of um, Estonia has embraced Curonian culture. In reality, I think it would be some, something of a mix. It's probably like an Estonian-influenced dialect of Curonian. Um, but yeah, we also have started to spread down this way. Some of the Pomeranians are starting to identify more with Curonian, or at least there's or so, Prussians, I mean. Um, so they're speaking... I don't know, probably a Prussian dialect of the Curonian language. It would be very interesting to see what the culture map looks like by the end of the game and discuss the linguistic and cultural implications of that. Uh, let's see. Outbreak of disease... Vikings are still looting our shit. Eager new recruit. Let's see. No protests. Okay. So we're going to have an initiation duel here. This guy doesn't look too good. He's got shit all over his face. Uh, okay. Satisfied. He gets to join. This is still not ticking up, is it? That's a that's an annoying bug. All right, accept vassalization. Fantastic. So the Curonian Kingdom has expanded once again. We have quite a sprawling empire here at this point. I mean, if you think about how long it it would actually take to get uh, from Rostock all the way over to like Nova Sill. That's that's a very that's a very long distance. That's like it's probably about the same as the distance from like Brittany to Rostock. We have a we have a long way to march to get to the furthest boundaries of our empire. Anyway, I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode um, and our little social history break at the beginning. Um, I am interested in doing more of those, but again, let me know in the comments how like how often you'd like me to do that if you'd like me to spend more time on it less time on it um whatever the case may be subscribe and hit that notification button if you want to hear more long tangents about social history um or if you don't <laughs> uh hit the notification thing so you can remember to bug me in the comments about uh uh not doing it or whatever um yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at AsaTJ. That's A-S-A-T-J. You are watching Lorsworn Gaming, and we will see you next time.